Brother, thank you very much indeed. Well, it's lovely to be here today. Thanks so much. I hope you've got the handout in front of you, uh, uh, just uh, uh, there, Honest Evangelism Lunchtime Seminar. So I hope that's there. I hope there'll be stuff to jot down. Just to say, how am I treating today? I'm treating today that I'm speaking to people who will be wanting to do evangelism themselves, but also wanting to equip God's people for works of service, Ephesians 4, 10 and 11. That's the job of the evangelist. So therefore, you're doing it yourself, but you're going back to your churches, and you need stuff to teach others. That means, and just by the way, to younger men here, if you're pastors, I see one or two, um, uh, when you're training and teaching people that are older than you, I found it's crucial to say this. Absolutely crucial. If I'm training someone 20, 30 years older than me, they're sitting there uh, listening, they've been around the block a lot more than me, what do I say to them? Can we see just the first thing here uh, on the sheet of paper? Um, listen as a river, not a reservoir. So uh, listening as a reservoir means you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, what can I learn? Okay, I know that, I know that, I know that. Listen as a river is, as you hear, who are you going to be training? First of all, non-Christian. First of all, non-Christian you'll want to speak to and Christian you'll want to speak to. So listen with 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 in mind. You then, my son, be strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who can teach others. But, you know, that issue, of, that issue of as I listen today, I might know this stuff, but I'm thinking of people to teach. So always at the start, I wonder if you can do this for me now, I ask people to, can you see the bits of paper here? Brothers, sisters, could you write down a Christian friend you'll be wanting to uh, teach this to? Perhaps you'll be wanting to pass on the um, uh, Honest Evangelism book to them, maybe this is the person, but also a non-Christian. So as you listen today, can you listen with those two in mind? So as you're hearing, you're thinking, how do I teach John, how do I teach Pam, or how do I pass this on uh, to them? Absolutely crucial, I think, that we listen in that way. And I find that uh, when I'm trying to train people older than me, who know much more, that changes their demeanor in the listening. Again, as I go through today again and again and again, I'm just wanting you to give you stuff that you can uh, take out to and teach others. Can I just say one other thing on introduction? We're finding in, in London now we are at a different point in time in terms of evangelism. I've no idea what's happening here. This is London. It used to be when I arrived at All Souls in 1994, all I had to do was make sure that in the DNA of the church program there were guest services and guest events, then you could run courses. So I had to fight. What was my job as I got to All Souls? My job was to do this. As I arrived there at All Souls, I I had to go, right, okay, let's just make sure we've got Christianity Explored running spring, summer, and autumn. So three times a year you get these in there with some guest events and guest services beforehand. And then I found that people just dropped onto courses. So you'd get, you know, loads of people would come on courses because they knew they should. What I find now is this, is that I put on guest events, guest services. I think we're running much better ones now than we did 20 years ago. But, it, it, yeah, but you know, as people come along now, they come on the guest event and guest services. You know, along, the, uh, along they come, and it used to be they'd come to it. I'd get them to fill out a form, a bit of paper. They'd drop onto the course. They'd just bring themselves because they knew they should. But now, what I have to say to the church family is this, and this will be what we're doing today, is that you bring your friend along at Christmas or to a guest event or guest service, you give them to me as I speak for 20 minutes, but the moment I finish speaking, you have to take your friend back. Then you have to ask them, well, would you like to look at the Bible with me? You've got to do some input. And then they might come on Christianity Explored or an Alpha course or whatever. What I'm saying is it's getting much tougher to get people on these courses. And what I'm saying, to, and, and I'm absolutely committed to people coming on courses, we'll see that as we go through, but I'm the course guy and I'm saying it's much harder to get them on there. And so today comes out of that and the thinking on that, in terms of training church family in a new place on evangelism. Great, everyone. Bits of paper here. As we're training for evangelism and trying to do it ourselves, first of all, what do we do whenever we're training for evangelism? What we do is this. Brothers and sisters, uh, please jot this down. Of course, whenever you're training for evangelism, you start with God. You've got to start with God. He is the evangelist, and the reason we're confident about evangelism is because of who God is. So the first thing I'm trying to do as I speak to you, as I speak to church family, is remind people of who God is. Can we look down, please? Here are some verses that I'm using all the time. I'm repeating them again and again and again. Do we see? Acts 17, verses 24 to 28. The God who made the world, writes Paul, says Paul in Athens. By the way, 
if he made the world, what's his plan for the world? Because it's his world. The God who made the world and everything in it, that includes you and I, is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So that's everyone on my street. Everyone on my street, he gives them life and breath and everything else. They're his. He made them. He's the creator. He's the potter. They're the clay. From one man, he made all the nations, Adam, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. In other words, with my neighbors, with my street, God didn't just make me, he made them, and he decided that they live there, and he decided how long they live, because he made them. Now, that's the first thing I've got to get in place with people. God has decided your work colleague is next to you. So the people live opposite me, and a guy works for BP in in, uh, London opposite me. He thinks he's come there to make a living and work for BP and bring up his family. Well, that's true, but that's not the big big thing that's happening. What's the big thing that happens? Because God has decided in his sovereignty that he works for BP and he lives opposite me. What's the big thing that happens? Now, hold on to your seats. Get the next verse. And if people get this next verse, suddenly, now here's the word to write down. It gives confidence. And my job as an, evangelism is to, as an evangelist is to give people confidence. Absolute, what's, what, what have they got to have confidence for? Can we look down? Let's have a look. He's made it. What's his plan? Can you see the plan? There's the plan. Hold on to your seats. Verse 27. God did this so that they'd seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So, God has made the world, and his plan is, is that people seek and find him and he makes a people for himself. So, what is the whole of history about? It is about knowing Christ. That is the whole aim of history. Now, my neighbours want the Christian faith with their worldview. They want the Christian faith to be aligned with something like croquet, if you play croquet. That's why it's got that importance, they think. But no, what's really going on in every life is that God is making a people for himself, and therefore, when they move in opposite me, there's a gay couple that live upstairs from me, When they move in upstairs, God has put them there. Fantastic. God has put them there for me to reach. God has put your your work colleagues next to you. Go to mini rugby on a Saturday morning. God has put the person next to you on a tube, on a train. Have the confidence that God is the one who does it. So what I keep having to say to people is this. Um, Where is the spirit in terms of going ahead of me in this? The Lord primes and prepares all And then when I jump off into evangelism, I'm jumping off, I'm going, God has decided this person's next to me on the tube, on the train, the neighbor. He's put them there. Now, what do I do with that? Secondly, what's the next thing I've got to do? We talk about God. Have a look down, brothers and sisters. Can we see 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6? You've got to teach God is sovereign, and his plan will work out in history, and it is that Christ should have a people for himself. What's the next thing? God is powerful. And can you just look down at those verses? These are so important that we've got to just look ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Now, I am convinced, and I was taught this by John Chapman, the Australian evangelism evangelist. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, brothers and sisters, is the most important passage on evangelism in the Bible. If you're training and teaching for evangelism, this is your go-to passage. And everyone in the church... From the 10-year-old to the 90-year-old has got to try and get 2 Corinthians 4 in place. I do it again and again and again and again and again. And as I do it, this is the first question I ask. Can you just answer this in pairs, just as you sit together, read through and answer the question. Here's the question. Please jot it down so you can train others with it. Here's the question. Who is at work in the work of evangelism? 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, who's at work in the work of evangelism? You've got a minute just to turn to the person next to you and do it. If you don't want to talk to the person next to you, just say, I don't like people, I'm not talking to you, just do it yourself. (laughs) Okay? Off we go. You've got a minute. Off you go. Who's at work in the work of evangelism? Read it through. We're moving fast. Please do it. Okay, everyone, we're moving fast. So just as we look down, I'll then ask people... I'll say, you know, who's at work in the work of evangelism? Let's have a look down. I, I, we won't, we're moving fast, so I won't do it. And what I'm looking for, of course, is verse 5. Who's at work? For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. So, we are to be, this is our job description, verse 5. I'll get them to pull it out as I'm meeting with people one-to-one. We preach Christ. That is our job. So our job is to preach Christ. And the word preach in the original there is herald. So it's not just from the front. We're to be heralds of Christ. 
As we're heralds of Christ, who else is at work? Anyone tell me? Which verse tells me who else is at work as I speak of Jesus? Verse 6, God is at work. Do we see now? Hear this, everyone, brothers, sisters. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Do jot this down. I say to people, Where does, where's, verse, where's that let light shine out of darkness from? Where's it from? Where's it from? Genesis 1. So the God who made the world in Genesis 1, amazingly in evangelism, takes the same power that made the world and he shines it into my heart and he does, here's the word to write down, a miracle and he gets me to see that Jesus is God. So the reason I become a Christian is that someone preaches Christ to me but then God does a miracle and, verse 6, he takes the power that made the world and God opens blind eyes and that is evangelism that's the definition we preach christ god opens blind eyes now what i then make people do as i'm trying to get this in place in my church family is i'll say on my left could you please pre say we preach christ and on my right could you please respond god opens blind eyes and we chant it let's have a little go shall we and by the way embarrassment and fear are a great means of teaching so if you don't say it you'll do it on your own and then i'll fly back to england in the morning okay are we ready so this half can you please say we preach christ, we preach and, christ. and can you please respond god opens blind eyes, god opens blind eyes. pathetic and again and we preach christ. God opens blind eyes. right when you're teaching evangelism get the church family to do it when someone doesn't do it, make them stand up and do it. If I, I only know the name of one person there, I won't make him do it, but I'd make them stand up and do it. i just say it again and again and again. We preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. As I speak of Jesus, God takes the power that made the world, he transforms my heart, and I suddenly go, Jesus isn't just a man or a figure of history or a great moral teacher, he's Lord and God, and it's because God does a miracle. Now that's why, when you ask someone their testimony and they say, oh, it's a bit boring really, I just came from a Christian home, do you know pastorally what you have to do? Very gently, you have to put your arm around them and take them out into the car park, don't do it inside, and then you headbutt them. <laughs> the reason you're Christian here is that God did a miracle. The reason you're Christian isn't just because you had a lovely Christian mum, although that's a wonderful privilege, it's because God opened your blind eyes. Do you thank him for it? Okay, next question as we look back down. How do we preach Christ? So first question, who's at work in the work of evangelism? Second question, how do we preach Christ? What verse is an answer on that, everyone? Which verse? How do I do it? Which verse? There's one verse that particularly tells me how, to, how I'm to do it. Verse 2, rather we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. We tell the truth. And the two areas where we tell the truth in the culture where we're failing to do it are wrath and repentance. Two R's, wrath and repentance. We don't, we don't tell the truth on, on that. So wrath, God's settled, controlled, personal hostility to evil. God is going to judge you. So what I say to people is this, as I preach Christ, I say, I'm nervous about saying this to you because I think it'll put our friendship under pressure, but I have to say it to you. So I acknowledge my fear as I say it, but I want you to know I'm convinced you'll stand before God at judgment. And I think, and I think you're thinking God will accept you by your own performance. And I don't think he will, otherwise why would he have sent Christ? And I acknowledge the fear. But I've got to teach the wrath of God. Secondly, repentance. Repentance is lovely. Repentance means I'm for what Jesus is for, I'm against what he's against. So have a look at Jesus and see if you can trust him to lead you. So this passage is absolutely key. I've got to teach the truth. How, so first question, uh, 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 who's at work in the work of evangelism? Second question, how do we do it? Verse 2, we teach the truth. What is verse 6, the application of verse 6? Two applications of verse 6, if God opens blind eyes. What are two applications? If verse 6 is true, what, what must I do in the light of verse 6 and actually verse 4, where the God of this age has blinded minds? What have I got to do? Sorry, brother? I've got to pray. Lord, please open open the guy opposite me please open his eyes open his eyes lord i must pray and secondly the results belong to god they don't belong to me and i know i know of a guy um actually from this part of the world who was sacked in his job when he went abroad um for lack of results by the elders and as far as i could see he was doing everything right they sacked him for lack of results now what do you measure me on according to verse five what do you measure me on 
when I get back from a mission, what, what's the question you ask me? Did you preach Christ? Look, I'm an insecure evangelist. I'm struggling enough with that. If you start measuring me on the numbers, what I'll do is go verse 2. I'll just distort the message to get more people. I'll say, oh, they won't want to hear about that their sexuality is under Christ's authority. I'll leave that out. And they won't want to hear about hell. I'll leave that out. I'll just leave out all this stuff so that, so that more come. Then, that, you know, then we'll be just full of people that are professing not converted. So, absolutely crucial. We come to 2 Corinthians 4. We preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. Third thing, before we jump off into evangelism, is this. Our identity is in God's grace. So, here I am. God is sovereign. He's, God, is, God is the one who has gone before me. Everyone around me has been put there by him. Secondly, as I preach Christ, God opens blind eyes. He is the powerful one. How do I know he's going to open blind eyes? How do I know? He's done it for me. If he did it for me, he can do it for them. Thirdly, as I jump off into evangelism, what I've got to know is this. Do you see thirdly? My identity's in God's grace. So here's the thing to jot down. Whether you accept or reject me doesn't make me more valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. So as I jump off and I say something, and, and increasingly in the culture, we're having to cross, and in honest evangelism, I say this again and again, the pain line. There's a pain line we're having to cross. There are some butterflies. As we're asking people to events, even giving a book, I gave a book to a neighbor's son on Sunday. As I knocked on the door, it was his birthday to give the book. I felt my, the nerves. I was thinking, no, maybe I won't do it. But I'm just saying, whether they accept or reject me doesn't make me more valuable. What makes me valuable is Christ died for me. And Tim Keller says, that's like one of those old, you know, um, chocolate machines or Coke machines at a railway station. You put the money in and you've got to bang it and it sort of clunks down. We've got to get that from here to here. So those three things have got to be in place uh, as we're going forward for evangelism. And when you're training people, what I suggest you do is begin your training with this question. Okay, what stops people doing evangelism? When you're doing training, start with what stops people doing evangelism. Start with that. Hear what they say. They will say, we're afraid of rejection. You then say, Matthew 10, verse 17, yes, the disciples were told, I send you out as sheep among wolves. You might get torn. You acknowledge the fear. You acknowledge they're going to be rejected. You acknowledge they're going to be, they're going to be uh, uh, marginalized. They might not be, but they might. You talk about, well, well uh, in, in the light of that, you, you, you just hear what they're saying. But the three things you're getting in place here all, all the time in the answering of those questions is sovereignty, power, grace. Sovereignty, power, grace. Those are the doctrines we've got to have. Okay, and I, I use that all the time. I, I can't stand up and teach on evangelism and think I know where people are. I've got to hear where they are. And then from that, I'm looking to get out sovereignty, power, and grace. Those truths. Great. On we go. Right, can we now turn inside, please? Turn inside your sheets of paper. And because the culture's hardening, in the light of the hardening of the culture, as we're training people, when they cross the pain line and speak about Jesus, here's the issue, brothers and sisters, they don't know if they're going to get hunger or hostility. They don't know what they're going to get. And we've got to prepare them for hostility, but actually, there might be a lot of hunger. In London at the moment, in Anglican churches, church going is going up by 2% a year. That's the official figures on the, on the electoral rolls. It's really boring. You know, the electoral rolls, 2% a year. There's hunger and there's hostility. There's huge hostility as well. You don't know what you're going to get. It means we've got to train people for better and better one-to-one -one work. But as we do that, I think what's important, I find, is it's important that actually the church family know that we know what's going on. Can you just jot down these words, please? Here they are, five words. Relativism, pluralism, individualism, gender, consumerism. So here are these words. Okay, just jot them down, and you've just got two minutes to define the lot of them. Okay? Just give me a definition of what these words mean. Because, brothers and sisters, this is what's going on in the culture. And if we don't know that, when we train people, they just go, well, you haven't got a clue of what I'm facing. So these are the five things. Relativism, pluralism, individualism, gender, and consumerism. By the way, I'm dyslexic. I don't know if I spelt them right, but you know what I mean, okay? Have we got the five? Again, turn to the person next to you 
and define each word. What does each word mean? We're doing this quickly, we want to go on. Let's just do it. A couple of minutes to define the words. What do they mean? Because this is what's going on. Nothing will stop Christ being preached, but this is what we're up against. Okay, everyone. Do take that away. I don't want to stay on it. I don't want to, I want to stay on the uh, uh, I don't want to stay too much on the culture, but let's just jot down some definitions here. We've got to know them because the church family have got to know that when they talk about these ideas that are knocking around or why people are resistant, we, we can actually, you know, name that. We're going to preach Christ into that. We've got to be able to name it. Relativism, what's that? Well, all claims to truth are relative because there's no absolute truth. The meta-narrative, the big story, is part of a power play. And you can never know what an author really meant, even if he's alive and telling you. Okay. Truth is a means of control. That's what relativism says. Truth is a means of control. And therefore, you can play with the text and do what, with it whatever you like. All claims to truth are relative. There's no absolute truth. Foucault, you can't know the truth, you can't know the author, you can't know right and wrong. Okay, secondly, pluralism. Because truth is relative, here's the issue, all ideas must be treated equally. Every, every idea, pluralism, has got to be given equal respect because there's no objective standard by which to evaluate its merits. Not least an idea like Christianity, which is just calling for submission and obedience. That's what people are thinking. Thirdly, as we go on, individualism. I think, therefore, I am. That's individualism. I think, therefore, I am. And the individual is the only arbiter of value and reality. And self is the only arbiter of knowing. So that's individualism. And the key is, with anything, here's the key to individualism. Do jot this down. Do I feel fulfilled? Do I feel fulfilled? Do I feel fulfilled? Does it work for me? So, church is a private leisure pursuit. If it works for me, that's fine. You can do church if it works for you. It's a funny way to spend your time, but if it works for you, that's fine. Gender. Gender. Texts exercise power. They must be deconstructed and given new meanings so that women, minorities, gays, or whatever it is, um, can redefine what it means to be human around the dreams and life they want. Gender. I redefine humanity around my dreams and what I want. It's all got to be redefined. And lastly, consumerism. Life is built around personal preference. Okay, how do I approach reality? Well, it's my personal preference. Okay, and by the way, God isn't the great provider, so therefore all I've got to do is fight for as big a slice of the cake as I can get. The reason I can rest is that God gives... That's how I can rest. God, God will feed my family. I trust him to do that. I've got to work, but I, I trust him. But of course, if you, the paucity principle is you've got to get the biggest slice you can. Everybody, just, I hate to go on, but that's, where the, that's, where, that's, that's my street. That's what my street are thinking. Right, what do we do? This is where people are at, brothers and sisters. What do we do then in the culture we're in? Okay, three things to equip our people. Can we just see them down the page there on the inside? Three things, being, doing, telling. So, in the light of where the culture's at, when I'm equipping people for evangelism, there are three things I've got to be doing and, and, and thinking of. First of all, being. Genesis 1, verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. Celebrate people. The people that God has put on your street, make sure you celebrate them, not just so that they'll become Christians or that'll be lovely, but celebrate them because they're made in God's image. And the way you celebrate them is you ask them questions. You become someone who asks questions, who's interested. Make sure you do that. You should know the names of the people on your street. God has put them there in the office, and you should be asking questions. And, and you know, the guy next door to me is an older guy called Michael. He's a real petrol head. I'm beginning to get slightly into motor racing with him. Never thought I would, but, you know, that, he, he loves it. You know, he's got these pictures down his stairs. I just walk along the staircase and look at them with him. Just celebrate them. Do you know, the bloke who was great at this was John Chapman. He took my dad for golf once. My dad was 40 years in tobacco. 
Okay, Chapo arrived. Now, a lot of evangelical Christians don't handle smoking very well, but I come from a tobacco family. Chapo turns up. Dad says, oh, well, I was in tobacco for, for, you know, 40 years because he's met my other Christian friends thinking, you know, they all go, oh. You know, Chapo goes, how fascinating, and peppers him with questions all day, just all day. And I remember my father's face at the end of it. He just enjoyed it. And for the rest of my, uh, my dad's now 85 with dementia, but I just was able to give him Chapo books because he just had a wonderful day and the guy was interested in him. I just could feed him. Chap John I said, oh, another book by Chapo. Oh, yeah. Chapo just celebrated him. It was the most wonderful thing. So first of all, being, we just make sure we celebrate people. Are we doing that? The guy on my street, one of the guys has just written this book called Reckless. This, uh, the, uh, uh, and um, uh, he's, uh, he's um, come out of the city. He's written this. Well, I'm buying it for the street. We're going to have a little, we're just going to have a, a bit of a book club with it. He's going to come in and talk about it. But just celebrate people. That's what we do. Okay, secondly, doing, doing. We do random acts of kindness. And what we're doing is, do you see 1 Peter 2 verse 12 there? Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Do you see it's so interesting in 1 Peter, the persecution book, 12 times suffering is mentioned in that. These people, they want to, because of, because of all this stuff, they want to speak against you, but they go, do you know, isn't it good they're around? So as Christians, we should be living these lives where they go, well, actually, it's great they're here. Random acts of kindness. And you see James 2, 14 to 7, it just says that, you know, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So there are two types of faith. There's faith with acts and faith without action. And he says faith without action is dead. So we need, to be, we need to be, but as we are at work, as we are doing this, by the way, it doesn't mean I don't believe in justification by faith. I'm just saying if it's saving faith, it'll be accompanied by action. What I'm saying, though, is uh, as, as, we, as we look at this and as we, as we um, uh, come to it and we look at this uh, uh, down here is that, yeah, where are the opportunities to serve? How can we do that? What are we doing on that front? And then thirdly, telling. So I've, I've got to know people. I'm looking to serve them and celebrate them. When I'm looking to serve them, I'm asking, what's your biggest pressure? You know, just as well, you know, what's the pressure you're under at the moment? And I'm sharing my brokenness. I'm talking about what, you know, what's happening with me. See, I find it really tough with dad. Sometimes I take my dad to the loo and my son to the loo in the same hour. You know, well, how do we work that out? But I lead with that. So that's what we do. So, so uh, being, doing, and then thirdly, telling. Okay, telling. I'm going to be nervous about this, but for my neighbours, as I get to know them and celebrate them, I'm looking for a pain line question with all of them. For the girl on the street whose back isn't getting better, I'm saying, what happens if your back never gets better? Because the Christian faith says there's a difference between human happiness, which is external, and Christian joy, which is internal, when, when you can be joyful but have a brutal time. Around those three headings, do you see the good, the bad, and the ugly? So the good, do you know there's, oh, there's some lovely neighbours I've got who by common grace are just lovely people. But I'm sort of saying to them, do you know there's someone like you in the Bible? He's called Nicodemus. Could we look at him together? That's a pain line as I'm getting there. Nicodemus had everything right, but he wasn't born again. He didn't know God. We think you're wonderful, but I think you're like Nicodemus. That's the, but I've got to go over the pain line to say that. The guy who my son waters the plants with, my son's four, waters the plants. I, 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 again, I want to say, are you an atheist or a theist? I think what I'm going to do is get my son to say it, and then I'll just back up and say, oh, so sorry, but, you know, he was, you know, who, who do you think made the plants? And I'll say, oh, you know, and I'll field it. I'll send my son in. And, you know, I had an opportunity to say something and said nothing uh, about a month ago. Absolute perfect opportunity to ask the question. I bottled it. But what are we looking to do? We're looking, with the church family, what we're looking to do is, 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 is just do these three things and teach our church family to do it. Now, on the doing, can I just tell you about this? This is a, a, a fascinating thing that Barna has produced, Talking Jesus, Perceptions of Jesus, Christians, and Evangelism in England. Do you know 70% of people in England, and we're, we, we, did a, we resurveyed it and paid for 3,000 more people to be surveyed because we were so struck by it, 70% of people in England have a Christian friend or relative they're impressed with. They say they live really well. 70%. Do 
20% of those 70% want to hear more. Now, the media is telling us that only 15% of people in the country have a Christian friend. It's not true. People are living, actually, amazingly self-sacrificing lives, according to this. But the question is, are we then going to cross the pain line and, 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 and articulate the faith we've got? People are living such good lives that they glorify God, even though they accuse them of doing wrong. This is an amazing survey. Do come and get it. I was very struck by a lot of what it said. So what are the questions I'm throwing out here? Are questions I'm looking to ask around the good, the bad, and the ugly? Ugly, are you aware the problem isn't just out there, but in, in here? So I'll talk about my house. So the problem, the ugly, this is the sin, the, the, the wrong choices we make. We trouble our troubles. The bad, does God want to meet you in the middle of what you're facing? Or here's the one I often ask, what do I pray for you in the middle of this? What do I pray for you in the middle of this? Just ask that. But it's a pain line as I ask the question. What's the right question? I don't know where it will go. Okay, but, 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 but the big place I'm trying to get on the pain line is this. I'm trying to get to this place. This is what I'm trying to train the church family to do, and this is what's new, I think. I'm looking for the whole church family to be saying this to people, non-Christian people as well as Christian people. Can I open the Bible with you? Can I look at the Bible with you? When you go away, we've got to start training our church families to say that. We aren't all Bible teachers, but we can be Bible sharers. Dick Lucas said, we've all got Bibles, we've got to work out what to do with them. Can I open the Bible with you? Now, the reason I'm saying that is, can we now turn the page, please, and look at page three, okay? Bible sharing. We're not Bible teachers, we can be Bible sharers. The telling of the gospel by the sharing of the Bible with an individual in our care, so they're drawn not to me, but Christ. So this is what's been going on and why we need one-to-one -one like we never have before. And I find when I do this diagram, it helps people um, get there with this stuff. Okay, have a look down there. This is 1954-55. Here's man. Hope you can all see it there. Here's God. Billy Graham comes and he preaches the cross. Anyone got any idea how, how many of the people who went to Haringey and were converted at Haringey, how many of them were churchgoers? There were 44,000 converted or professed faith. How many were churchgoers? 90%. 90% were in churches. But Billy said, repent and believe. Okay, so that's 1954. Again, I don't know what's happening in Belfast, but this is... Or, or Bangor, but this is, um, uh, this is uh, 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 London. 1994, when I arrived at All Souls, the media have started doing their work, and there are great blocks in the way of people coming to faith. Okay, this is now 1994. People, they, they think Christians are weird. You know, they meet Christians, and, they, and the, the media depicts them as weird. And of course, sometimes you meet a Christian, you go, oh, my dear brother, you are weird. <laughs> Don't you find that? But I want to say this. They were weird before they were Christian. Don't blame it on them being Christian. <laughs> Secondly, it's irrelevant. You know, I mean, if that's the choice you want to make, that's fine, but it's not relevant to my life. Thirdly, it's untrue. Look at what Richard Dawkins is saying, the Da Vinci Code. I mean, it shows that Christianity was there to suppress women. That's the Da Vinci Code. And it's homophobic. So we've got these cultural issues that we're facing as we're going along, and I reckon 1994, often it would take people, you know, as we knock these over, often I'd say, look, it takes 18 months to get someone on a Christianity Explored course. You know, a year to 18 months, let's be patient, keep running it, they'll come. But where are we now, 2015? Brothers and sisters, this is where we are, okay? People are on this road here, they're on a totally different road. This presumes they're heading towards faith as they get to here, see their sin, come to God and come on a course. But now they're over here and they're looking in that direction. And therefore, as in no other time, the absolute key for people coming to faith is an individual. They've, there's got to be one-to-one -one Bible sharing. As I say, here's the illustration to take home. Here, it used to be they'd come along, we, you know, an event like tonight, they come along, you say, here's a course, they say, well, I must do that. I, you know, I've been meaning to do it for years. They drop onto the course. Now, tonight, at the Baptist event, I'll tell you, they're all, they're, I mean, it's great, tickets have been sold in pairs. People come along, we'll give the talk, there'll be the testimonies. I reckon unless the person at the end says, well, do you want to look at the Bible with me? Or, 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 or you know, come on, let's do some more stuff. They're not going to drop onto a course. It just needs so much more energy. 
Therefore, what I do to, to do this for people, could you do this now, please? Could you score the first church you went to out of 10 at the next four levels? Could you score the first church you went to from the front on teaching the Bible, in a small group on teaching the Bible, one-to-one -one and at home? So people reading the Bibles for themselves. So evangelical ministry happens at four levels. We teach it from the front, score that out of 10, the first church you went to. Small group work. If there was no small group work, they get naught. Okay? Was there small group work? How was the Bible taught? Thirdly, did anyone sit with you and open the Bible one-to-one -one with you? And lastly, as far as you could tell, how good was the personal Bible reading in the church? You can't see that, but how high was the value for it out of 10? Can you give me four numbers out of 10, please? Front, small group, one-to-one, -one, and at home for the first church you went to. If you're sitting next to your pastor, just be kind, okay? <laughs> One time I did this and I said in a small group, I said, what are the numbers? And one girl said, I said, from the front. And this girl said, 10. I said, 10? I said, who was that? She said, my father. It was good, wasn't it? It was rather sweet. Okay, off you go. One to 10, four numbers, please. Front, small group, one to one and at home. Do you see it there? Taught publicly by a gifted teacher, studied in a small group, helpfully applied one to one, prayerfully read at home. Four numbers. The quality of the teaching. Front, small group, one-to-one -one and at home. Out of 10. Everyone clear? Everyone scored? Done your scores? Right, everybody. With your four numbers there, if your lowest number, the lowest number on the bit of paper there, was one-to-one, -one, in other words, no one opened the Bible with you individually, if that was your lowest number, can you stand up, please? if one-to-one -one was your lowest. Okay, now how much is that? Is that 60% of the room? Okay, do sit down, please. So the others, that's great, that's a good number. People read the Bible with you individually. Someone did that. Can I say, that's the talk today. That is the issue we're at. We've got to redo this one-to-one -one thing. Because actually people aren't dropping onto courses unless they, unless they get individual help. Because, here's the issue you see, with what's happening in the culture, with this stuff, they actually need, with this stuff, they need to personally be sat down. They've got to be beckoned. Uh, can we, uh, with our bits of paper now please, just turn over to the back page. Can you see Psalm 103? Let me just give you an example of one-to-one. -one. Okay. Have a look at that. When I was 15 years old, I was playing tennis with a 19-year-old. And between sets of tennis, he said to me, could I look at the Bible with you? Between sets of tennis. He got out those verses, Psalm 103, 13 to 17. He asked me two questions. Okay, have a look down. Now, when you're doing one-to-one, -one, as you train people, please hear this. Don't say to people, can I teach you the Bible? say to people, the Bible's the teacher, we're going to see what it says. That stops people feeling they've got to be the teacher, because they're just Bible sharing. If they think they've got to be the teacher, they're not going to feel they can do it. You say you're not the teacher, the Bible's the teacher. We ask questions that enable the Bible to be the teacher. Everyone got that? Now, just in pairs, please, could you please work out, because the key to reading the Bible one-to-one -one is getting the right questions. Have a look down. What were the two questions that that guy asked me between sets of tennis, when he opened Psalm 103. He crossed the pain line, he said, do you want to have a look at it? He asked me two questions. Have a look at that, those five verses. What were the questions that open up the verses? Thanks. Uh, got a, two minutes to do that. Can we do that? That'd be great. Great, everybody. Okay, can anyone tell me, what were the, there's some, there's some sheets coming out, but we'll have a look at those in a moment. Anyone tell me what the questions were he asked me? What's the point of life is good? That gets through there. What, you know, Verse, f verse f 15, as a man, as a, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. The two questions he asked me were this. Rico, what does this passage say about man and what does it say about God? Those are the two questions. What does it say about man? Do you see? Verse 14, we're dust. My godfather just been killed in a cl cliff fall, I knew that. Verse 15, we are dust, but we flourish. That's why... Friday night at Ravenhill, there'll be many people there. They won't be bothering with God because they're flourishing. Look at me. 
we do flourish, but it's over so quickly. Verse 16, it's place remembers it no more, you're gone. That's what it says about man. What does it say about God? As a father has compassion for his children, the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. He said, Rico, that's like my fear of the sea. I love the sea, but I don't play games with the sea. I don't go 30 miles out and jump into it. I respect the sea. And then, the moment I, I was converted, uh, verse 17, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. He said, Rico, God lives forever, and the wise thing to do is to link up with God. Then you'll live forever. And at that moment, he lifted me up and I saw over the fence into eternity and I spent the next 30 years working out that moment. That was a 19-year-old with five verses over five minutes with two questions. It's so simple. That's one-to-one -one work. Just get the Bible open, ask a couple of questions and say, let the Bible be the teacher. That's how I was converted. I suddenly thought, yeah, of course you link up with God. Of course you do. And at that moment, God opened my blind eyes. Of course you link up with God. I tell you what, he said, let's play the second set. It wrecked my second serve. I tell you what, I walked back on. <laughs> That's it. And then you just say, I'll tell you what prayer is. God speaks to us. In the Bible, we speak back to him. So as a prayer, I might go. This is the first passage. I always keep this in my wallet, this passage. I give it to people. I say, can I just show you how I got, this is how I came to faith, these words. If you're Anglican, they're read over your funeral, so you might as well get them in place now, I say. <laughs> but I, I, and I say, what strikes you most? And they might say, well, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is those who fear him. Lord, and then I'll say, I'll repeat the, the words, I'll say, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is those who fear him. Lord, help us both to understand this. Amen. So I pray about what God's spoken to us about and then say, when do you want to meet again? Now, the issue that we had in this country was this, brothers and sisters, in, 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 uh, 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 in London, okay? Even though I was saying this, people couldn't get the questions. And then there's been a revolution three, four years ago when Becky Manley Pippert wrote this, Uncover. Have you heard about this? So Uncover was given to students, and it's six studies. You've got one of them there in front of you from the prodigal, where, now this is the big thing. Please watch this. You don't do any preparation. This is Uncovering the Life of Jesus, what happens is, you say to your student friend, your non-Christian student friend, have you looked at the documents for yourself? Don't you think you should look at the documents? You might have taken them to an event. Do you want to have a look at the Bible? Shouldn't you look at the documents? And then you say, oh, I haven't done any preparation. You slit it open, and you just read the questions. And Becky has got the most amazing gift for writing questions, and the, the happiest times I had last year was doing Uncover with people. And so now, people get this, and this is what they do. So tonight at the, um, uh, at the rugby event, what I'd be trying to get all the men to do there if they brought their friends is saying to the guy next to them, do you want to have a look at the Bible? Now, when you ask them, do you want to have a look at the Bible, what can they say? They can say two things. Yes or no. If they say no, you know your identity. The other day, one of my neighbours, I said, do you want to look at the Bible? He said no. Yeah, okay, well, I've given him the chance. It was agony, but he said, no, no, I don't really. I've known him for two years. We go to the swings together. No, I don't really. Okay. But the great thing about this is there's no preparation required. And it's been amazing because as an evangelist, alongside the guest events going on, there's now one-to-one -one reading of the Bible. Richard Cunningham, the head of UCCF, brothers and sisters, listen to this. He reckons through Uncover, because the students are doing the Bible individually, and he's been at UCCF 20 years, he says we've seen more students converted in the last four years than the previous 16 because it's not just events or the one or two heroes from the navigators that open the Bible. Everyone's doing it. At All Souls, people's kids are coming back from university and they're saying, yeah, I'm doing Uncover with three people. Well, the parents are being shamed into doing the Bible because the parents up to then have said, I can't do it. Well, now they can do it because their kids are doing it. But this material is being crucial. Please take away that, that outline you've got of the prodigal. Just see the questions get you into it. They just get you into it. Whether you've been a Christian for years or not at all, they're brilliant questions, and they just open it up with no preparation and go through. I must draw to a close. Let's have a look down as I finish, please. What are the benefits of one-to-one of, 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 of -one work? I'm just closing now with this. The benefits of one-to-one. Of, of -one. So I keep having to say this about the benefits and the building blocks because people are, it's just not part of the culture. This is the issue. This is what they say. It's not my job, it's the pastor's job. Well, unless we all do it now, can I tell you, no one's coming to events, so the pastors will just have breakdowns. We can't just do trellis work 
which is just, you know, I mean, this is amazing trellis work outside the building of this. We can't just do trellis work, we've got to do vine work. Now you've built that, you've got to have in those little tables people sitting down looking at the Bible together. So, the benefits, understanding. You can look into their eyes and see if they've got, they've got it. Application. You can apply it to their life as a 35-year-old technician or whatever they are. Example, they can see into your life. We don't just invite them to church, we invite them to our lives. We share our lives. Confidentiality, very important for men. No one else knows. Just you and I meeting. This is safe. No one else knows we're looking at this. Won't tell anyone, we'll just meet individually. Training, what's the next step? Because it's not just I'm trying to get someone with me here. I'm saying, well, look, there's a course. You can come on a Christian Explored course that you can go and do some service over there. This is how you can learn. Flexibility. I can meet when they're free. When are you free to meet? One guy I met with, he was never free. This is when I was single. He was never free before 10 o'clock at night. We always met after 10. Ah, but I can be flexible. Okay, the building blocks as we look down. Let's finish with this. Character, conviction, competence, courage. Character. Are you someone who's repenting and believing? What blocks people is they're not doing that. Convictions. Here's the conviction. Please write this down. This is my job. It's not just the pastor's job and the elder's job. It's my job. Competence. Well, as you keep doing it, you'll get better. But uncover is unlocking it for people. This enables you to do it. Just ask someone to look at the Bible with you. Go through the questions. See how you go. Courage. You've got to have the courage to say, would you like to look at the Bible with me? You know, the first person I ever read the Bible with, I was at rugby training my first year at Bristol University, and it was after the first year, we were back for pre-season, a guy called Andy was next to me, and there we were, and he said as we were lining up, he said, I've had a terrible summer. I said, oh, mate, I said, why? He said, my brother was killed in a farming accident. I said, oh, Andy. He said, yeah, he said, he said um, yeah, a machine just collapsed on top of him. He was dead immediately. I said, oh. He said, um, my brother was a Christian. I said, he was a Christian. I said, he said, yeah. He said, it's made me think. I said, and it just came out. I said, well, do you want to look at the Bible with me? He said, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I just said it. Anyway, someone told me Isaiah 53 was good. Did you know that? Apparently, it's good. So I got my questions. I went round to his flat. I knocked on the door, went in, got my Bible out. I started reading it. I was so nervous, I started to sweat. So I was reading through Isaiah 53, and I was sweating. And he said, Rico, you're sweating. I said, no, no, I'm fine. He said, you're sweating everywhere. I said, no, no, I'm fine. I said, I've got my questions here. I had the questions. Typical rugger head. He went, yeah, no. No, yeah. So we were done in two minutes. Over. <laughs> then I said a prayer. And then I said, well, I said, do you want to meet again? He said, yeah. I said, was it good? He said, yeah. He said, are you going to sweat so much next time? I said, I hope not. <laughs> but you've got to start. And I'm saying, if you're anything like my church, this is the silver bullet. This is the silver bullet, the one-to-one -one work. It's the silver bullet over the next 20 years. Because they've stopped just coming and they won't just drop in. The silver bullet is where the people will do the one-to-one -one Bible sharing. And let me finish with that. Brother.